rebuilding a large Clarkson single cylinder vertical steam engine, and this is making a new piston. The original gunmetal piston's quite well made, but it's a rattle fit in the bore and it's designed for soft packings. I want to use a silicone o ring like this one. The first thing to do is to check that the silicone o ring fits in the bore. This is a 2 inch silicone o ring, 2 inch OD, and it fits quite well in the bore. Originally the finish on this bore was not suitable really for an o-ring in my opinion. It was a little bit ridged. I showed in a previous episode how I used a cylinder horn to get a good finish on the bore. It's best to have a good cylinder finish when using silicone o-rings. What I'm doing at the moment is selecting a piece of metal to make the piston from. This is some cast iron, some very close grain cast iron, obtained from the usual place that I get all my metal from and I'm using the old piston and very crudely marking out the thickness. Simple and effective. It's not a precision piece, and when I start to machine it, I will machine much deeper than this, and then finally finish it using a micrometer. I have the piece of cast iron currently held in a four-jaw self-centering chuck in the larger of my two lathes. I use this chuck a lot, I find it's really good. In this clip, I'm taking the first cut, and this is beautiful stuff to cut, I'm reducing the outside diameter just over two inches because it's miles too big at the moment. And the reason for doing this in this lathe is because it's easier and it puts no stress on the piston rod. When I finally finish the piston, it will be mounted on the piston rod itself. So if I take most of the metal off, and if you watch here, you see I've gone past the line. The line is the exact size of the piston. I've gone past it about, oh, I don't know, eighth of an inch maybe. I've speeded up the video now because otherwise it's going to just get really tedious. Cutting cast iron on a home lathe is quite a good thing to do. This stuff cuts beautifully. In reality, I have the lathe in back gear and it's running very slowly. And as usual, I do like to avoid comas setting in with my viewers. I could always become a speaker for the Narcolepsy Society if there's such a thing. I get some quite good comments and I got one the other day from a chap who said he went to the kitchen after watching one of my videos and fell asleep on the kitchen floor. Well, I can't be held responsible for that. If you want to go and look in your fridge, it must be that that put you to sleep, not my videos. Anyway, this is an exciting bit. Well, it's not that exciting. I'm parting off the finished piston blank. I'm using a parting tool for this. And again, the lathe is going really slowly. It is going nowhere near this speed. This cast iron stuff is quite hard, it's very free cutting, but one problem that I do have with it, occasionally some of the chips will get trapped between the sides of the tool and the work, and this will cause quite a noise. Or maybe a complete lock up and break the parting tool if I'm over ambitious. So once the groove is deep enough, I back off the tool and take a light cut down either side of the groove to let the chips go on their way. As this has been cut dry and it's okay with cast iron because it's got a high carbon content, it does get hot. It would be great to flood it in coolant like you see on these big industrial machines, but I do believe that this industrial coolant is very nasty stuff. Right, this machining is getting too boring, far too boring, so I'm going to speed it up. That's more like it, 7,000%. And just about there, yes, it's here we go, and the piece will drop off any minute. And the high point is... And here is the piece after I let it cool, and it doesn't of course fit in the cylinder, I would be quite depressed if it did. As you can see, it's a little bit bigger than the original piston. So what I need to do now is finish the machining on the smaller of my two lathes, my old Boxford. And this is, again is a great little lathe, it's very old, it doesn't look very pretty, and I should really clear the swarf out of it much more frequently than I do, but it works well. The good thing about this Boxford lathe is it uses less electricity than the big one I believe, but the chuck is very accurate. It's a very old beaten up looking chuck, but appearances can be deceptive. I'm a bit old and beaten up and I'm still quite accurate. The only bad thing about this boxwood lathe, it does not have power traverse, so I'm having to turn the handle here, but I've got to do something and it's not that bad. I'm facing off the piston, and as you can see, I get quite a good finish straight from the tip of the tool. This cutting tool is just a tiny bit low in the tool post, I need to get a quick change tool post, I get a bit sick of messing about with this one. But it's all I've got for the moment, so it will have to do. You don't need lots and lots of fancy equipment to make things. I've seen some amazing models made with very modest equipment.
So what I'm doing now is using a centre drill. You can't see it for the chuck itself, but I'm going to use a centre drill to make a hole in the end of the work. This will be followed by a twist drill, which is a tapping size twist drill of 9 30 seconds of an inch to allow me to tap the hole 5 16 by 32 threads per inch. And here is that drill, 9 30 seconds of an inch, which is two imperial sizes down from 5 16 of an inch. For ME threads and BA threads, this is what you generally do. You use a drill two imperial sizes down as a tapping size. For instance, if you wanted to tap a quarter by 40 hole in a piece of metal, you would use a 7 30 seconds of an inch drill, which is two sizes down from quarter. But as I've just said, this one is 5 16 by 32, so I'm using a 9 30 seconds of an inch drill. When I was much younger, I used to read the model engineer, and I used to follow the teachings of the guy called LBSC, Lillian Lawrence. And that's where I got some of these ideas from. And they work. I've made quite a lot of model steam engines and none of the parts that are bolted together with threads that I've cut have ever dropped off. But I'm sure someone will come and contradict me on this and send me a very wordy description of how to do it. On the original piston, a percentage of the hole in the centre was drilled out to support the rod. So I'm doing the same. That way, the piston rod will be exactly the same length as it was previously. As a precaution, just in case my thread is not good enough, I'm using some Loctite 638 on it. So this is not going to come off at all unless I heat it up with a blow lamp. I do notice that this Loctite 638 is a little bit more viscous than 601 or 603. I hope it's just as strong and I'm sure it will be. Right, it's time now to fit the piston blank to the piston rod. It's worth remembering at this stage that the chuck has to be very tight on this rod. You do not want it to spin round. So here it goes, yes, it feels very good, nice and snug. Now the edges of this piston are very sharp, the perfect right angles. So I'm using an old towel to grip the piston, and this way I can really tighten the piston blank onto the rod without the fear of cutting my hand and bleeding profusely all over the workshop. In this clip, I'm checking the original size of the piston with the micrometer, because I need to accurately finish the blank to be exactly the same thickness. I now need to take several light facing cuts across the front of the piston blank. A word of advice, if you're doing a job like this, always remember that when the piston rod is in the chuck in the way this one is, it's only supported by the piston rod itself. So go easy. And of course the lathe is not really going as fast as it looks. The video editor was used to speed up the cut. Once the piston blank is cut to the final thickness, I then use a centre drill to make a hole in the end of the rod. And what I'm going to use this for is for a revolving centre to sit in, which will support the piston blank whilst I cut the groove for the o-ring. But before I cut the groove for the o-ring, I need to get the piston to the finished size. For this I've used a caliper and I've taken the measurement from the original piston. Because I'm using an o-ring, this piston actually needs to be slightly smaller than it would be if it was using soft packings. So the original piston, which is very slightly undersized, is fine. And with the magic of video allowing me to speed this up to a ridiculous speed, you will see me machining this part to the finished size. So now we have a piston. One more very fine cut takes it to exactly the same size as the original piston. Now we need a groove in it. For the groove, I'm using a small parting tool. And this is the main reason for having the piston supported by the live centre. This really would rattle and chatter if it was just supported on a 5 16 piston rod. If you are doing a job like this where you're fitting an o-ring to a piston, it's most important really to get the data from a Zeus book or some sort of book that gives you the o-ring's tolerances. I've done a lot of these so I tend to busk it. All I can really say is the o-ring does not want to be nipped tightly in the groove. It needs a little bit of space to float about. So you can either look up the tolerances and specifications and get it precisely right, or you can busk it and you'll get it wrong probably a few times, but after a while the penny drops. Usual health and safety warning, be very careful when filing in the lathe, but it's good to remove the sharp edges, both on the inside of the groove and on the outside of the piston. The groove was thoroughly oiled before I fitted this o-ring and there's some more oil going on the outside. This is steam oil. Do not use machine oil or motor oil 
on silicone piston rings it makes them sticky and it fits beautifully in the cylinder there is a little bit of shake on the piston this is intentional there has to be a bit of float so the o-ring can do what it's supposed to do it's time now to assemble the piston with the lower cylinder cover and make sure it's central to the bore now i know it's going to be because as i said earlier the chuck on my old boxford is quite accurate if in doubt use a set of collets buy yourself a collet chuck thankfully i don't need to buy another collet chuck i've got one for the big lathe and it's just a time saving thing why i didn't use it and it's a bit unfair saying oh yeah yeah use a collet chuck i think it cost me about 700 pounds when i bought it but however you do it make sure that you use an accurate machine tool when doing a job like this thanks for watching i hope you found it useful